Navigating through uncharted waters, that's the task at hand for teachers, administrators, parents, and students who just started the new school year. The back and forth over what's considered safe in the classroom has led to a debate over in-person instruction or sticking with distance learning. Join the discussion on what's it going to take back to school during COVID-19. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of What's It Going to Take on Insights on PBS Hawaii. Start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. The new school year looks very different during the COVID-19 pandemic. Lunch boxes have been replaced with laptops and face masks and hand sanitizers are now on the school supply list. There's also a, the debate over in-person instruction, distance learning, or both. And if and when students and teachers head back to campus, how do they stay safe? Our panel tonight includes administrators, teachers, a parent, and student as we ask, what's it gonna take back to school during COVID-19? We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org and the PBSY Facebook page. Now to our guests who are all appearing via the internet tonight. Catherine Payne is the chair of the Hawaii Board of Education. She's a retired educator whose career spanned more than 35 years. Prior to retiring, she was the principal at Farrington High School. Corey Rosenley is the president of the Hawaii State Teachers Association, the union representing more than 13,000 public school teachers across the state. He's also a teacher at Campbell High School in West Oahu. Mitchell Otani is starting his 11th year as the principal of Kalani High School. Prior to that, he was principal at Kaneohe Elementary for 19 years. From Kauai tonight is Kevin Matsunaga. He's entering his 28th year of teaching and is currently at Chiefus Kamakahele Middle School in Lehue. Kim Ekimoto is a parent of three children, ages 8, 12, and 16. All of them attend public schools on Oahu. And Taylor McCann is a student who just started her junior year at Waiakea High School in Hilo on Hawaii Island. Well, we've been underway for 10 days or so in school, and let me just go around and find out how it's going. Let me start with you, Taylor McCann. How's things going for you as a student the first couple weeks of school? What's, how have you been engaged and what's going on in your school? Well, obviously it's a big change. Um, classes are a little bit weird. It's hard to be social with your peers. And when I go to school, I'm really vocal, I guess. And it's easy. Back to school season is really fun because we get to kind of chat with each other and while paying attention, kind of talk about how our summers are, what's going on, if we're keeping up with our lessons. And now it's a little bit harder because everything's online so like to unmute your mic and try to like say something to your friend in class kind of disrupts things <laughs> um we're only 10 days in but you can't i'm doing a notes. pretty good job doing a pretty good job staying involved i have a lot of homework already um i've been trying to keep in touch with my friends over social media and try to kind of help each other with any questions we have over that um so it's a little bit rocky start but so far i think i'm doing okay um kim Ekimoto, parent of three kids How's it been? I mean, do you, they must, you must be going crazy. Um, it's not uh, as crazy at the, as I thought it was going to be. I think what stressed me out more was um, the possibility of going face to face and with their starting of their school day, it's staggered. So if my elementary student is needing to log in at eight o'clock and I'm still dropping off my middle schooler or my high school, how was I, you know, how would I get them all online? if we're still commuting um, in, in the vehicle. But um, this was the first week that we really got our toes wet into classes. So um, the teachers have been great. Uh, they're encouraging um, and they're really, I think, been paying attention to how they've been, how our children have been feeling emotionally too. So um, I'm really thankful for them to pay attention to that as well. It's just the curriculum, you know. You know, after so many months without communication, without the socialization, how is your how are your kids doing getting back to school? Are they excited about it? They're excited. Of course, they miss their friends. Um, it's it's just a different, you know, it's a change. Um, I do feel for some of the children. I noticed that some of my uh, children's classmates, they're home alone, even at the young elementary age. So I just I can't imagine, you know, how they're 
managing and how the parents are feeling having to leave them, you know, to just kind of, um, you know, do this on their own. Well, that is kind of really sad. Uh, Kevin Matsunaga, teacher on Kauai, how are things going for you as, as a teacher? I think this year has been definitely the most stressful of my career. And I think a lot of my colleagues would probably say the same thing. Um, a lot of us have just had to completely change the way that we're delivering instruction, you know, pretty much overnight. And, um, you know, we have teachers that are older and maybe not as technologically savvy as others. And so the, the, tech, the technology part has been, you know, difficult. Um, it's just been really, really stressful. Can you be a little more specific about what's the technical challenge for a teacher? I mean, I don't know that we've talked to a lot of them about this. Like, what's what's it like? What What's your day like, um, a typical day? Well, it kind of depends on your schedule. Um, you know, on certain days we have what's called asynchronous learning in which, you know, we have lessons that are posted into our Google Classrooms and students on their own will go and access the lessons and, you know, do things on their own. And then we have a second day in which they show up for a call just like this, in which they all log in uh, on their computers. And so it's been you know, tough for teachers to uh, have to learn the tools to record themselves you know, and to keep the lessons engaging um, at, at the same time, because it's not just putting a camera on yourself and just talking to your students. You know, it's, it's, about, it's much, much more than that. It's you know, bringing in other resources or having uh, activities for kids to do and all of that takes time. And a lot of that just requires a lot of effort and a lot of learning new skills. And so it's, that's, it's been tough. Um, Mitchell Otani, what, what's the challenges for a, a school principal this time of day, this time of era? Um, well, a lot of it has to do with uh, having to make plans and then change directions and, and pivot on, uh, depending on what's going on out there and the numbers rising or, uh, I think we were very ready to open uh, to do in-person teaching and in a hybrid type of manner with our kids. Um, and then the numbers started spiking. So it's been very challenging when we have to change plans. But, you know, I'm lucky I'm surrounded by very good teachers and staff that we were able to adjust to the different conditions and um, we're able to adapt in this uh, uh, growing uh, pandemic. Um, the key word, I guess, for us has been flexibility. We we try to our best to be very, very flexible in adapting to whatever the conditions are. You also, um, as a principal, have to deal with teachers, some teachers who just don't want to come back to school because of their safety issues. I know at Kalani, I mean, I went there too. We, we tended to have senior teachers. Um, I don't mean senior citizens, but more of the, the experienced <laughs> teachers, but they were older um, versus the younger go-getter ones who just want to get in the classroom. Did you have to do a lot of management in that respect? Um, you know, with regards to teachers, um, they all pretty much wanted to come back and work with the kids and they miss seeing the kids. Uh, we do have uh, some that have um, some conditions that will... Um, factor in, but again, the department has telework program guidelines for all employees. And, uh, you know, I believe that teleworking is an important tool that helps employees to balance their work uh, and their quality of life concerns. Um, so with us, you know, the requests to telework in our schools are handled on a case by case basis and decisions are made based on conversations that we have with each uh, affected staff member. And what we do, we try to focus is on the conversation. Uh, the, and the focus of the conversation is not on the whys, but I think on whether the individual can fulfill the job requirements. So in making those decisions, principals look for what is in the best interest of the students, while at the same time examining whether there are any negative consequences. Okay, thanks, uh, Mitchell Otani. And Corey Rosenley, that goes leads right into you, the dealing of you're representing teachers and uh, telework issues. I know that we've been seeing very convulsive days. Almost every day there's been some sort of convulsion. Um, overall now, though, after 10 days, how do you feel most of your teachers are doing when it comes to this new normal of teaching online? Well, I think Kevin put it right. The teachers are stressed. And then there's this other layer of stress that occurs because, you know, I appreciate that Mitch is, 
allowing his teachers to telework, but we have uh, schools and complex areas where they're not allowed to telework. And the teachers are really worried about their safety. Um, and then you have special education teachers that some of them are still in crowded classrooms and they just keep on looking at when the mayor says, you know, if you can work at home, work at home. And they're not given this opportunity and they're put into unsafe conditions and they just keep on saying to themselves, this isn't fair, this isn't safe. And that's another layer of stress that is occurring. And I ask, so of, of the 13,000 or so teachers that you represent, I mean, would are the vast majority of them embracing this challenge and, and coming to work and, and enjoying work and succeeding at work? The professionalism of teachers in this condition has been amazing. I mean, you should see the creativity that they're trying to put in and having to literally reinvent the wheel when it comes to teaching. They're working harder than they've ever worked before. And it's frustrating to people believe because we're distance learning, they're not working hard. They're working harder than ever before. Thanks, Corey. Catherine Payne, I, I, I saved you for the last of this round, Robin. You've had probably uh, one of the more convulsive jobs as chair of the school board, overseeing some hours and hours and hours of long meetings. Let me just ask, you know, Big picture, how do you feel like it's going given all the curveballs that you guys have been dealing with? Well, I think the challenge of the school board is that we don't get engaged in the nitty gritty of how things are being rolled out. And yet so much of the concerns that are coming our way really deal with that. And people expect us to be responsive. And we're trying to, to be responsive and also um, recognize that that we have a couple of really important priorities as a board as we move forward. And one, the number one priority was the safety and the health of our students and the adults on the campus. Everything else falls under that. Um, the second, of course, and almost as as high a priority is. How are we going to make sure that we educate the most vulnerable children? And I was disturbed, but understand what Kim was saying, that there are families that are having to leave their children alone now in order for them to accomplish their learning on their own. I think that's a huge concern. I think there are many things that are happening right now in our society that are really beyond the capabilities of the schools to handle. The trauma that families are experiencing will come to schools. The traumas that teachers are experiencing may cause us to lose some of our teachers over, over time because their world beyond the classroom is also a critical worry for them. So I think there's many layers of issues and we've touched on them. Corey has certainly been making sure we're aware of them, but <laughs> teachers are doing amazing things right now. And I think we have to honor that, but we also have to recognize the challenge of the time that they're in. You know, um, Kim and, uh, and Taylor, a question for the student and the parent. How do you feel about the amount of work you're being given? I know, Taylor, you said you have a lot of homework. Um, do you feel like it's a lot different? Or, I mean, it's certainly different from classroom learning. Do you think that teachers are making up for the fact that they're not seeing you? by putting a lot of work on you. I'm curious, and also Kim, I'd like to hear you, uh, how your kids' workload is breaking out. But Taylor, go first. Well, I can't speak for other schools, but my school, we're going to online virtual Google Meets classes every day. And we have the same kind of schedule that we do when we're in person. So I'm not in person, but I'm seeing my teachers the same amount of time I would be seeing them in school. So I don't think I'm getting any more work than I would be in school to make up for me not being able to see them. With that being said, I do think the work's a little bit more challenging just because it's in such a like new way. And obviously I do a lot of work online anyways, just because this day and age, everything's online. So I know my way around Google Classroom, Google Docs, mm -hmm. Google Slides, and like websites like Khan Academy and all that kind of stuff. But the usual stuff that we do pen and paper, like things like free white, free writes, things like taking notes. Some of my teachers are requiring that we do that kind of stuff online so they can monitor what we're doing. And it's kind of strange and it's kind of a strange concept to try to do that. Explain that to me. So like you're, you're listening to a lesson, 
typing notes and they're seeing your notes in real time on their computer? Is that what you're saying? Oh, well, some teachers have been lecturing and they have their own notes that they then share with us. Some teachers have been lecturing and letting us take notes on our own pencil paper. But a lot of my teachers want to make sure, especially for kids who turn their cameras off, they want to make sure that we're actually paying attention and doing our work. So they'll assign us like a video or they'll get like a that someone else made or they'll give us an article that they found online that explains what we need to learn for the day. And then they'll let us leave our meet and they'll assign us in Google Classroom a doc that we can go on. And since they have access to it as well, they can kind of watch us type as we go. So they can switch around between different students' docs during the whole class and see if we're paying attention or if we stop working halfway through class. Oh, I see. So it's, it's kind of like the teacher walking around the classroom looking over everybody's shoulder. Exactly. Okay. It's just like, I'm like their way of... I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's kind of losing me in the technology. That's my point, though. It's crazy, like, yeah. everything that you can do with all this technology. No, or kids... presenting, presenting slideshows. That's pretty crazy. Oh, my goodness. So, Kim... Um, You've got your kids are, are, are pretty well spaced in the system. Um, just briefly describe what each one's day is like, because I'm interested that Taylor actually is going through a class schedule every day. Um, is that like that with a kid who's in elementary school, too? Yes. Uh, well, we had the, uh, I guess, AB schedules for the students. Um, all of my children had uh, different days where they would attend face to face. But since we went into distance learning, now they're online every day um, and pretty much for a full day. So for my third grader, uh, that child, they're on and off the computer several times a day. They do work with the teacher as well as independent work. Um, I think the challenge with the third graders is that they're just kind of starting to get used to using technology and the computers. So, you know, learning how to add a different tab, learning how to log into their um, online learning tools, you know, what is a URL? Um, how do you put in the password and the username? Those types of things. Um, uh, the chat box has been, uh, I think, a little bit challenging or exciting for some students, but a little bit distracting too. So it's, you know, just different age groups, I think, uh, has its own challenges with technology. Um, my seventh grader, uh, pretty computer savvy, and, um, you know, they've all been doing testing this week, so that's been taking up some of the time, um, and as well as my 16-year-old. Um, let, let me ask, Kevin, um, you're in middle school though, right? How are yeah. you guys, are you guys operating it? Do, do each of the kids see each of their teachers every day? Yeah, so we're kind of in a AB schedule as well. On Mondays, we have what's called like office hours, and it's, a, it, you know, the whole day is, is just open for students to reach out to their teachers to schedule meetings with them or to contact them for help. And then on um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we have what's called our A days. And so on Tuesdays, students will do their lessons online. Uh, and then Wednesdays, they'll will meet their teachers. Uh, the teachers will have a video call like this. And then they will, you know, each uh, for, we have our, our schedule a little, is a little bit different. We only go until lunch because we didn't want the students in front of a computer for the whole entire day. And so we have shorter classes uh, you know, 45 minute blocks that will go until lunch. And then on Thursday and Friday, we just repeat for repeat that schedule for the B students. So we are seeing our students um, just once a week, though. That's that's the tough part. You know, it just it just strikes me that it's just so different from one school to the next. Uh, Corey Rosalie, um, as a teacher at Campbell, how are they handling it? Uh, you guys have got this humongous school population. How is that being managed? Well, it's all online. Um, you know, I have a daughter right now who is a senior. In fact, I think she's doing homework right next door. Um, Can we see? So she's been I'm going, kind of curious. She's been going to class. Can we see? Uh, you show it to her later on. I... No, no, no. I'd have to bust down a wall to do it. But uh, uh. she's been going to every period every single day. She's been logging on and getting instructions. She's already, just like any good student, she's complaining about the amount of homework she has as well. You mean complaining about it? Yeah. But I mean, as a, as a, as a, as a, someone who represents teachers, how difficult is it to get a handle on what's going on when every school has a little bit of different interpretation of the way to do this? Well, that's been sort of the problem is that across the state, it's all over the place. Um, 
some schools are 100% distance learning for all students. Some are bringing on special education students. Uh, and that's the same thing for what teachers have to be on campus as well. Um, even, you know, until today, you know, the good news came in finally that it's going to be distance learning until the end of first quarter. But even that was different across the state. Um, so it, it has been frustrating for teachers. Um, but for the most part, our teachers are handling it. They're trying to make do. I know some teachers, I know as Kevin said before, you know, they're just, they're really stressed about it. Some, unfortunately, are thinking of leaving the profession. Uh, Catherine Payne, I'm, I'm curious as to why is it that we have a system like this where so many decisions are left at the school level? Well, the, the juxtaposition of this pandemic came along at a time when we were working really hard to um, put the, what we called school empowerment into place. And that's what Mitchell was talking about. He was on the program before um, because having schools make decisions at the level where the teachers and the students can know what is best has been the movement across um, our educational system in Hawaii. And I think that sometimes that has really caused some difficulties for schools when we have an epidemic that is, is common to everyone, as opposed to some of the other issues in school that are not so um, that are unique to the schools. So I know that schools have been asking for more um, standard decisions on a number of things. And that has been forthcoming, certainly with respect to how we handle um, a virus uh, notifications and, uh, and those kinds of things have been standardized, but the decision on how to um, handle the instruction has not been consistent. And I think um, we need to look at that because a number of, of people have reached out would like us to be more consistent in how that is done, parents and, and teachers and principals too. What's the value in doing that, do you think? I think it, one of the things that we need to make sure we do across the state is take care of the children who um, don't have strong voices, the children whose parents are not English speakers because those parents are not able to help them as much. We need to take care of children who really are not able to learn on the computer. And that's what um, Corey has spoken about, the special education children. Um, and we haven't really found the, a great way to do that yet because it's just, um, it's it's a huge challenge and we, we must do it, not only by law, but but morally, we have to take care of these youngsters. Um, and that comes right up against how do we manage that in a health crisis? Because so much of that will be face-to-face -face or it will be in different kinds of, of situations where we have to work either in the home with the child um, or in small groups in the school. We're well, still trying getting... to figure this out across the nation right now. And I know HSTA has some ideas, other places have some ideas, but no school system has rolled out opening of school this year um, in a way that we can say, we're gonna do it that way, because it works. <laughs> Clearly not. Um, now, this is a question that was directed to you, Catherine, as board chair, but, um, and, I'll, and I'll put it to you, but I wanna go around the panel again on the issue of safety. Um, to the board chair, I'm a special ed teacher. Do you really think it's safe to have special ed students on campus, and I wanna be, and I want them safe too? Um, you know, the people who are on campus now are the most vulnerable students for the most part. Isn't, isn't that correct? And how concerned are you about safety in that community? I, I am very concerned. And we have more students in certain schools. So they're clustered in large groups in certain schools. And already we're seeing some situations that are, are causing concern. Um, I know that there are some special ed teachers who've done amazing things and who've told me that we can figure this out. We can do, do this even online with a lot of support. And, and some of them are doing it already. If we expect that, however, we're gonna to have to really, really up our support of those teachers because the bottom line is we cannot leave those, those youngsters behind and those families behind with those children. So. Mitchell Otani, how are you handling that issue at, at Kalani High School? 
Well, like everything else, um, health and safety always comes first. So we want to, you know, the challenge for schools is to balance that health and safety with providing the students with challenging and rigorous curriculum. But, you know, when we look at vulnerable, the department has defined vulnerable as those students who do not benefit from distance learning or those that have difficulty accessing and making progress with the curriculum. So they end up coming to school and we want to make sure that everybody is safe. So we practice all the distance, uh, the, the distancing, yeah. Distancing, sorry. And, and we make it so that uh, the teachers are safe. We equip all of our uh, teachers with masks and face shields and plexiglass barriers. And, um, you know, we've been getting shipments of other supplies that come in and we mask up in the rooms and uh, we do what we have to do to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, you know, that is first and foremost in the minds of everybody that's on campus, especially in the minds of the principals. As a principal, does that end up being sort of like you you end up being the safety cop on the on the campus? I mean, how do you make sure that all those standards are being followed, all that equipment is there? Did you like have to assign someone specially to do that? Or is that something that you end up doing yourself as a principal of a smaller school? Um, well, no, you know, um, just a quick one. Kalani is now the 12th largest public high school in the state. Uh, we're at about 1,500 students, but wow. I have an excellent um, staff, uh, many of which uh, were working during the summer. They're either 12-month teachers, and we were working up to the day that we had to come back to school, ordering what we needed to do. Uh, we brought back uh, some vice principals early, and we were ordering all the supplies that we needed, and um, we... Um, had a company come in and paint lines so that we have directional arrows on our campus where the students will walk in one direction. Uh, we have a company that comes in every night to sanitize our classrooms. Um, we're trying to be proactive about doing things to make it safe for everybody. Let me ask Kevin um, Matsunaga at Kauai, do you guys have that same level of resource at uh, Chief Kamakaheli School? I think to some extent, like our, our administration has provided you know, masks and, and cleaning supplies and gloves and different things. But I just, I hear everyone talk about like how safe, health and safety is, is a top priority, but I don't know how that is possible when you bring in 400 students to campus on a given day. You know, like we just had four days of, of students on campus. We split up our, our, our you know, normally we we're at 900. We brought about 450 students on campus and, you know, everything we hear about, you know, uh, no more than 10 to a group, uh, six feet of social distancing, you know, somehow the DOE says, oh, no, you can do it with three feet. You know, like I, I don't understand how some of the, the, the logic applies into some of these, you know, allowances that are OK for schools. You know, like Oahu, you guys can't even have more than five people. And yet I have more than I have. At one point, I had 18 students on, on, my, on two of my dates in a confined space. And so I don't know how we're, we're really saying we're going, we want kids to be safe, but yet we're bringing so many kids on campus. Do you personally feel safe? I don't. Uh, I don't. Taylor McCann, you know, you're a young person, totally immortal. Uh, how do you feel about safety on campus? Are you and your peers nervous about this or do you feel like everybody's following the rules? I mean, you haven't really been to campus much, have you? No, none of us have been back since March. Okay, so um, so you, I guess safety is not an issue for you except in the when you're not on campus, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, everyone, everyone kind of cares. Some people care more than others. Some people's family care more than others. So I know that there are some students and some of my friends who aren't doing the best job following the rules. And I know that there are some students who are doing a great job following the rules. Um, but yeah, none of the kids at my school are back to school yet, but all of my teachers have been back on campus every day since the beginning of August. And I know that some of them don't really mind, but I know that a, a lot of them have spoken to me about pushing to try to be allowed to teach from home. And I'm not, I'm not sure what the rules are, and I'm not sure if they differ from school to school, but I can't imagine why they wouldn't be allowed to teach from home as long as they have sufficient materials and technology to be able to 
lecture from home and join Zoom calls from home because not only is it endangering their safety, but I feel like the more we send people out and send people to work who can, in theory, work from home, I feel like it's not helping slow the spread as much as we could be, at least. Uh, Kim, uh, Ekimoto, parent of three, uh, did I hear you say that you did have to take um, at least one of your children to campus recently? Yes, uh, for my third grader, we had to send them onto campus to pick up their computer and their tech book, textbooks. Um, we did a drive-through for the middle school. Um, the high school also did a drive-through, but um, you know, prior to knowing what school was going to be like for the start, um, you know, my 16-year-old is involved with student association, so they were meeting in small groups and things like that on campus. Um, yeah. Okay, so so what do you how do you feel about their safety and safety is an issue for you as a parent? Uh, I'm nervous about their safety. Um, you know, there's families out there that still have essential workers that need to go out to work. Um, and the, you know, temperatures, that's great to be able to take their temperatures, but with people walking around the community that are asymptomatic as well, um, you know, you just don't know. So, you know, Corey, be as careful. Corey, recently, I, I was surprised to hear Kevin Matsunaga mention having so many kids in a classroom. Um, just to clarify, Kevin, is is that recently, or was that like summer school, or was that is that how you're operating now? No, well, that was last week, and you know, my class, the the group that I had of 18 was a little bit different, just because of the kind of class it was, and so I asked to be, you know, moved. I'm norm I normally teach in a computer lab, and there was no way that I was going to be that you could fit 18. And so I asked if I could use, you know, the back part of the library uh, to have my, you know, class back there so I can have everything open up. But it's, we're still in an air conditioned building. You know, uh, the library is still used by other people. And so, um, you know, I, I, my classes range from uh, 18 down to seven. And that was all last week when we brought students on campus for four days, four full days to pick up their Chromebooks and meet their teachers and take diagnostic tests at the same time. Why was that necessary at your school? Is that because you have a lot of kids that have a challenge of getting distance learning and needed that time? Or what was the reason for that thinking? You know, it's, it's, we, we've instituted you know, a one-to-one -one Chromebook uh, distribution for, for a couple of years now. And so all of our students have, have had Chromebooks at their disposal. At this at their disposal and what happened was you know we allowed students to take the chromebooks home like we were one of the you know only schools that i know of in which a student was given a chromebook and then allowed to take it home to continue their work and so when the, when the whole pandemic thing hit and we were forced to stay at home all of our students already had devices you know other schools are scrambling but we were kind of already ahead of the game um but it's you know it's for for them to come in you know our school felt they needed to run these diagnostic tests uh, in math and reading so that, you know, their spe our special ed teachers could then work on IEPs and get things ready. And, and it was tough because those, those tests took up a good chunk of our day where we could have been, you know, maybe, you know, uh, getting to know our students a little bit better. But, you know, it's, I understand that that data is needed and, and that's what we chose to do. Corey, uh, Corey Rosalie, I see you shaking your head. And I, I, I have to guess it's about just, Hearing this is what you hear all day, every day, right? So the frustration is when you hear is what Mitch says and Kevin says and Taylor says and Kim says that it's different at every single school and you have hundreds of kids going onto a campus and being crowded into a classroom in the middle of a pandemic. And you know, uh, I want to paint the picture of what I've heard from our special education teachers where you can have 50 or 20 kids in a classroom because some of the kids need a one-on-one -on -one situation. And you're definitely not six feet. Some of the kids can't wear masks. And so these are very frustrating teachers and they just feel like their uh, health and safety is at risk. And they can't beat this. Everything goes across the state. Um, you know, for uh, Taylor, right next to her school in Waikia, you know, there was a, a charter school, a blindfolded charter school, Ka'eo Meki, where even staff came down with the coronavirus. And so, you know, there has to be the realization that just because a child has special needs or is an English language learner doesn't make them impervious to this virus. 
nor does it being a teacher make you impervious. And so we've got to, you know, for Taylor's teachers, you know, the least time they're on campus, the least likely it is to spread. And so that is definitely a concern. They should be able to telework. So let me ask this question, um, and, and this goes to the teleworking question. It's a question from JJ and Wiley. For public schools, DOA has changed distance learning's end dates, end dates a few times now. Why not just admit we shouldn't think about going back into in-person teaching until January? Uh, a, a couple of questions along those lines um, that just sort of like, let's figure out this online thing before, before we try and bring people back. Um, how much urgency do all of you feel about getting people back? Is it something that's very important to bring students back to school? Uh, Taylor, what do you think? Personally, I don't think it is. And I know that I'm struggling with online school because I've never had to do any of this kind of work before. And so are my peers and so are my teachers, especially. But I think that the more we keep working at it and every day that we go to school, we're just getting better and we're just getting more tech savvy. And honestly, the whole world is pretty tech savvy and we're only going to get more tech savvy from this point on. So it's not bad practice to have. I'm learning a lot. And I think that my education is very important and I'm a junior. I'm almost out of school and I would like to milk whatever I have left. But I think that my health and the health of the health of others around me should be our main priority. And right now I'm doing fine and I my classes are hard and I have homework and I'm struggling with it. So I think I'm learning. I'm stretching my brain plenty. So I think why not keep going? We're only going to get better with practice. And if we push everything till January, what's really the harm? Okay. So let me ask Kim Ekimoto that who has been home with three kids for six months now. <laughs> I'm curious as a, as a parent, how much relief would it be and, and, and would it be worth it to you to have the kids go back to school even in these conditions in a, in a, in a couple months, say? Well, you know, I've uh, worked from home for a long time with my own business, so um, I feel like I've been preparing for this <laughs> for quite some time. Um, so I don't mind, uh, you know, in my situation, I don't mind being at home with them. Um, I see it as a chance for me to work more closely one-on-one -on -one to give my, my third grader some one-on-one -on -one, uh, tutoring, I guess. Um, but, you know, if if they're going to be home and it's safer for them to be home, I don't mind uh, doing the distance learning school uh, education. Uh, Mitchell Latani, I'm curious, what do you think the impact would be on a school like yours if you just said we're going to do everything online um, until 2021? As I look at it, um, you know, there has to be a metric as to when schools are safe enough for students as well as faculty to come back. Uh, you know, as it is right now, the numbers are high. I think it's a good idea to go to the end of the first quarter. But as we go forth and to look at taking it uh, week by week, month by month or whatever it is, but there has to be some number out there that what is it that would be safe enough for our kids and our staff and everybody to come back. And then at that point, it should be that we can go back to school safely. You mean a, a number in, of community spread, for example, or infections as opposed to, yeah, a number like that, a community number? Yes, yeah, so whether it be single digit uh, cases like we had in early June or maybe just low double digit, I, I'm not exactly sure, but there has to be some metric that we can set out there that we can have that will say, okay, this is safe enough for everybody to return to school. Let me ask um, uh, Kevin Matsunaga, this issue of one-on-one -on -one, uh, help, um, you know, Kim mentioned it, uh, and then I'm getting a number of callers. What about students who have no digital access? Um, I imagine they're going to have to get digital access at some point. I mean, there's like, this is not an option of not having it anymore. I, 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 so Correct. they do need some support. But I mean, do you think a teacher uh, can be as effective one-on-one -on -one if it's just one-on-one -on -one through a screen as having to have the, each other physically present? Yeah. You know, like there's no teacher that I know of that would rather teach that way. Every, every teacher wants to be back in the classroom in front of students and able to work closely with students and be able to walk up to a student's desk, you know, help them with something. Every teacher wants that. And that, that shouldn't be questioned at all. Like we all want 
our students back in the classroom, but we want to be able to have that done safely. And I think, you know, what Mitch said, I, I totally agree. We need to have some sort of metrics in place that can state, you know, when it's technically safe. I mean, I don't know if it's ever truly safe to have, you know, students on campus, but, you know, is it much safer when we have maybe the percentage of tests versus positive cases, that number is, is really low. And I think that's what's been frustrating for teachers is that there hasn't been much direction in, you know, from the Department of Health, from our state, you know, Department of Education on what that looks like. You know, we heard stuff in the beginning of the pandemic that if there were no cases for, you know, four weeks or something like that, or two weeks, uh, you know, schools won't open until then. And we all looked at that and said, there's no way schools are going to open. Catherine, so, you know, uh, here we are five months later, we, we got to figure something out. Catherine, uh, from the school board point of view, you've, you've heard all this as well. Um, do you see just sticking with distance learning all the way up until the new year as, as being a more viable option than continuously trying to look for a date? I think um, just as we look into the future and make a prediction, it seems very likely to me that that will happen because I think cases are going to be continuing to go up. They're testing a lot more people. And I think we can just expect that community spread, at least on Oahu, is going to increase considerably. I think it's also really hard for our teachers to switch. You know, we talk about just pivoting back and forth, but pivoting is not easy. And when you finally are starting to, to get where you need to be and then to make that big switch back because both types of instruction take a considerable amount of planning to be effective. And I think we have to really um, look at the schools and the teachers who are we're asking to implement this learning. Um, it's, it's about health and safety, but it's also about how can they be most effective and what, how much can we ask of them to keep changing um, as they're moving along. You know, um, let me ask this of a, of a couple of you folks. I want to read a couple. Uh, Cara on Facebook, might there come a time when teachers and students could pivot to the best match for their needs? Catherine, that's exactly what you're talking about is, you know, a teacher might be really good at technology and able to work from home, um, whereas another teacher might be really a, a good one-on-one -on -one teacher via home instructions, and, and a student might be a really good distance learner, but another one might need to be in mm -hmm. school. Are we going to be at a place soon where all those things can happen, or are we basically going to have to take time to figure this out, and we're all just feeling a little rushed? Corey, why don't you take that one first? So to the previous question, you know, school systems are either closed completely right now, or the ones that have tried to open, like Georgia, it's been a train wreck. Uh, 2,000 people in Georgia right now are quarantined. So, you know, I think what we've got to decide, it's got to be about not a date, but the data and the research that shows that you can actually open a school system effectively. And I mean, this is new for everyone. And right now the data is showing that no school, school system has been able to open effectively without an outbreak of cases. And so I think to what Kevin was saying earlier and what Catherine was saying, our teachers need clarity. The sooner we can make this decision, the more they can start getting some stress off of their plates and science to think about, okay, what do I need to do for next semester? And knowing for that entire time what they need to potentially to plan. Mitchell, I'm curious as to how stressed out your teachers are. Um, it, it varies across the board, but you know, like everything else, they are anxious to see the kids, but at the same time, you know, the, the numbers going up has not been very helpful. Um, with that being said, uh, we're going to do the best we can with uh, whatever is thrown at us and our teachers are excellent and, you know, I, I receive, um, I have a group of seniors that is a senior advisor group and I receive very positive comments from them as to how this is going in the classes that they've attended. And um, so again, the teachers have worked very, very hard to present the, the curriculum in, a, in the platform that they're given. Uh, but nothing really replaces that one-to-one. -one. Like like Kevin said, every teacher wants to be working with the kids in the classroom. And, you know, when that time comes and they'll, you know, and when the numbers are lower, they'll feel less stressed and ready to tackle that challenge. You know, there's been a lot of focus on getting equipment to kids, right? Getting the Chromebooks to kids. 
um, or students and getting the families somewhat familiar with the system, getting Wi-Fi out there, right? And I know that there's still people that are not being served in that way, but we haven't heard as much about the teacher's ability to telework from home with the equipment that they have. And I did get a call from a, a public teacher on Kauai saying, I'm a public school teacher. Some of my fellow teachers haven't even been given a properly working MacBook and have to use a student Chromebook. We need proper equipment to teach. Um, and then a couple of anonymous callers, you know, how do we apply for, how, how do we even get a chance to try it? I mean, um, let me ask uh, Kevin, how, how much ability do teachers have to telework? Like, what's it like working from home? Do you, could, I mean, you're a younger guy, maybe, compared to me, but... Not that would young. You, <laughs> would you be able to work from home doing basically the same thing you're doing in a classroom now? I can do it because I am, I teach digital media. And so having cameras and, you know, all this equipment, like that's for me, I'm, I'm fine with teaching at home. I, you know, I have a, a pretty stable internet connection. I have the equipment, but you know, a lot of teachers would like to stay in school because they have less distractions, you know, so it kind of varies from person to person, you know, some, some teachers, their kids are at home and they might want to be, you know, away from some of this, the distractions and, the technology issue is a huge deal. Like teachers need equipment that can allow them to do it. And it's true. Like that teacher could be from our school because we've had to give teachers Chromebooks, which are, which, you know, aren't that great for a teacher to create lessons on. And so we're trying very hard to get everybody, you know, a decent computer, but it's tough. Just, uh, just so I understand the Chromebook is a, you usually doesn't have a whole lot of memory in it. That's why it's inexpensive. Right? Yeah. It's a glorified keyboard with a screen is what it is. It just connects to the internet. It doesn't have a lot of RAM. It's cheap, you know, and the reason why we use it is because they're cheap. You can buy them for $250, $300, and we can give every every kid, you know, a device. And if they break it, it's not a big deal. Like if we gave them a MacBook, that's, you know, $1,000, that's much, much tougher to, to replace, right? But we got to give our teachers decent equipment. We have to. Catherine, you know, in, in the emphasis that I've heard, uh, up from the DOE, there have been so much emphasis about getting the equipment to the to the kids, to the families, um, and less emphasis on getting equipment to student schools, so teachers. Do you think that that's something that needs to be accelerated as well? Absolutely. But I also think that that's one of the reasons that the department and the some of the principals have really wanted to keep the teachers on campus even if the students are not because they have more technical support they have more equipment on the campus that teachers can use so that's part of the dilemma but certainly i believe uh, my understanding is as we move into the uh, next phase of this after the four the first four weeks um, there will be much more flexibility to request uh, telework from home, but along with that will be some discussion about whether they have that capability to provide the, the um, technological support that they, they need from their homes. And then let me ask, uh, let me throw this out. A couple of callers, Kathy from East Honolulu, I've seen school kids crossing the street together without masks, no distancing. It's, it's too soon to go back to school safely. Um, are they checking to see if schools have enough PPEs? Our school doesn't have enough. Kailua Kalaheo complex. I mean, we seem to be, there seems to be a consensus here that we, there shouldn't be a rush to go back to school. But uh, even when you do, do you think that the schools are capable of physically keeping people safe once you have them on campus? Kevin, I see you. <laughs> Nodding vigorously, no. Look, we, we can't even, we can't get adults to socially distance. How can we expect <laughs> kids? To, I, and, I, and you know what? Like, our school is trying. Like, when we had kids on campus last week, you know, it was the saddest thing to walk past the cafeteria in the morning and see all of our students in the cafeteria, six feet apart, facing one way, not able to talk to anybody. But at lunch, you know, out when, when there's not as much supervision, you know, kids are crammed in different places and, it's, and they're all together. And you know, you talk to them and you tell them to separate and then they, they separate and then they come right back. You know, and our PA system, every time we have students transitioning, our PA system is making announcements, stay six feet apart, but you know, they, they don't do it. And I think it's you know hard to ask kids 
to or to expect them to do it when our adults can do it. Taylor, you know more about kids than anybody else on this panel, I think. So what, what do you think? Do you think there's a message that could get through to, the, to, to, to younger people to do that? Or, or is that really not going to work? I mean, sadly, I think the only thing that could really get through to us or get through to those of us who don't really care as much right now is if we were to go back and not socially distance and not wear masks and for a lot of us to get sick. I think that might be the only thing that's serious enough to kind of give us a wake up call to start paying attention and taking this seriously. And I've actually had a lot of conversations with my peers before all the news came out that we were going to start being 100% distance learning. That was pretty much all of our main concern. We weren't, at the time, we were going to be going to school once a week, and we weren't really worried about our education either. We were just worried about all the kids at school who don't care and who are posting about not caring on social media. Oh. Hey, Corey, I didn't give you a chance to talk about the equipment for student, for teachers at home. What kind of investment do you think it would take to send half the teachers home, for example? I mean, how many well, millions and millions of dollars would that cost? A lot of our teachers do have the equipment at home. Actually, their bandwidth might be actually better at home than it is at school. Especially when you have all the teachers at like Campbell, where we have over 200 teachers trying to access the internet at the same time doing video. Um, they actually would prefer to do it at home. And to the point that Taylor said, is that kids, teenagers, I've already seen, they, they, they congregate before or after school um, I've seen pictures of teachers where kids aren't like they put the mask but they're not covering their nose. That's part of the problem is, is that the kids they want to be social, they want to get close together, and they're not going to follow distancing rules and math. That's always our concern. Hey, Kim, uh, I, I'm curious, you know, is a good question for someone in Waipahu. Uh, what is the DOE's plan for the youngest students, kindergartners and first graders? Older students are better equipped for learning uh, on Chromebooks. And then uh, talking a little bit about another comment from a former teacher, should tier the entries back to schools. Some groups perhaps do need to be in school before others, and the schools can adjust to that. How do you feel about your, your, your youngest child's um, inability to be in a, in a school? Um, it just, it still makes me nervous. Um, you know, like, like Kevin said, you know, it's hard for adults to social distance. Um, it's difficult for the children to do so. Um, yeah, and, and the teachers can't be around campus 100% of the time watching every single student. So, you know, there's going to be those times, recess, lunch, where they might be able to uh, congregate with one another. And um, yeah, just the opportunities for them to be a little too close with one another and the potential of getting sick. Uh, it's... But I just, I guess what I'd like to know though is that, um, do you feel like, actually I don't even know if that's a boy or a girl, sorry, your, your youngest, is that, do you think that he or she is being held back by her inability to be in a classroom environment? Um, I think this is so new to her that, um, you know, like Taylor said, uh, hopefully it can just, get better from here on if we are going to do distance learning for the rest of the year. Um, computers, I don't think it was that uh, big of a learning tool last year. They, they were introduced to it. But this year, they're doing much more of their work on online on, on the computers, typing and things like that. Um, so, okay. you know, I've got I've only got a, a couple minutes left and I'd like to put these questions to Mitchell and to Catherine Payne as the people who've been in this system the longest. What do you think is the positives that might come out of this? You're seeing this tremendous new technology coming in, this tremendous challenge. You've seen challenges before in your careers. Do you see positive things looking ahead that can come out of this? Mitchell, why don't you start? Um, I think there's a lot of positive that has come out, you know, despite all of the pandemic and everything. I think we have now an opportunity to reinvent how we deliver instruction to students. And we have many, many more tools to which we can deliver this instruction in a meaningful way to the students. And then uh, Catherine Payne, I've got about 40 seconds, 45 seconds. What do you think? What, what jumps out to you as a veteran about a good thing that might come out of this? Well, I think we've all 
built a lot more skills and technology than we ever thought we would need. I think education has been changed forever because of this. And you mentioned earlier about different um, learning styles of different children and even teaching styles. Maybe we will be able to match these a little better so that if there are children, we have some charter schools doing this already where there are children that really do learn well online and teachers that teach well online. If we can match them up and use those, um, those skills and the new technology, I think, um, I think we'll come out better in the end, but it's gonna be a long road. This isn't gonna happen right away. We have a long struggle ahead. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, the future is now. Mahalo to all of you at home for joining us tonight. And we thank our guests, Chair of the Board of Education, Catherine Payne, HSTA President, Corey Rosenley, Mitchell Otani, Principal at Kalani High School, Go Falcons, Kauai teacher, Kevin Matsunaga, parent, Kim Ekimoto, and Hawaii Island student, Taylor McCann. Next week on Insights, we go back to our election 2020 coverage with the two candidates running for Hawaii County Mayor, Ikaika Marzo and Mitch Roth. Please join us then. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.